So this is our title, Driving Anti-HIV Duo CAR T-Cell Therapy to the Clinic, Free Clinical Studies Towards a Phase 1 2 a Clinical Trial. I'm Remus, Scientific Director at Karen Cross, and as mentioned, I also hold the faculty position at the University of Washington here at the Bentown Center for Childhood Cancer Research. And I'm presenting data that was primarily generated, coordinated, and uh, marshaled by Dr. Kim Anthony Gonda of Karen Cross. And uh, I'll review just for the sake of review and for the sake of um, everyone here, uh, what this process is we're gonna be talking about today. So over in the upper left, we have a picture of two cells. On the left is a T cell, and on the right is an HIV infected T cell. So let me turn on my laser pointer here. And so this is what we're calling the duocard T cell. That's the one that we've engineered to express some new proteins. And this is the HIV infected cell that is expressing on its surface, the GP120, really the GP160 molecule, which is the envelope protein of the HIV virus. What we've engineered this cell to express is two new proteins, two new glycoproteins on its surface that interact with this molecule that's expressed only by the HIV genome. And that when this interaction occurs, we get a chain reaction of events within this duo CAR T cell resulting in what we call degranulation, which is a release of perforin, which is a protein that punches a hole in the opposite cell's membrane, and the introduction of granzymes and other mediators that lead to death of this cell. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to kill all the HIV-infected T cells in the body, whether they're latently infected and just reawakening or actively infected. So for a little bit of um, uh, let me, some uh, background, I thought I'd pull out the following slide. I hope it's not too shocking for, for people, but um, here we go. Uh, and the left, this is from the Baltimore Evening Sun in 1990. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and this is a picture of, of myself uh, suited up because I was working in the hood uh, with some live HIV cultures. And uh, at Ellenbeck, Dave Schwartz, Bob Silicano, who I think you all know very well, and uh, James Hildreth, who was my PhD advisor at the time. I was a graduate student, and Dr. Hildreth's lab, we were the first lab within the Hopkins Sciences buildings to work with live, live virus, actually. Uh, there were lots of patient samples running around and lots of uh, collections going on, but actually doing biological studies with live virus, everybody was actually really afraid of it. And uh, really, it was Dr. Hildreth's leadership that says, you know what? We're going to just do it. So we hung Nike signs all over the lab, and we got some live virus culture, and we started to uh, work with live virus. And uh, it was interesting how much blowback we got back from our uh, fellow investigators on the floor. They were really scared. Um, they kept on throwing regulations at us, but none of which really existed. These were very early days. I mean, 1990, you can calculate how many years back that was. <laughs> and because we were working with actually uh, live HIV cultures, that's when you know Bob Silicano said, hey, you know, I got some ideas. And we had a couple of really high impact papers with him in the very early days of HIV research. But that was not possible without the other part of this slide, which is uh, really the community mobilizing, active, activating everyone's consciousness that we had a real, real crisis going on. So these are some marches from New York. Lower right is a die-in, and this is the plea for AIDS research, not AIDS hysteria. Um, I remember being in graduate school at that time, and it was, still was AIDS. We didn't know that it was a virus. We hadn't isolated the virus. And within a few short years, lots of progress began to be made, but it was not without this really strong push by the community. So um, I'm just really moved by the community and I wanna thank the community. And I wanna thank especially the activist community because none of this would have happened. Um, I was meditating upon this talk and this history this morning a little bit and just the Magnificat came to my mind. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. He's looked down with favor on me, God's servant. From this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. And it may not feel like it, but I think the entire medical community, the entire patient community for so many diseases was blessed by this activism because without this, we wouldn't have had breast cancer activism. We wouldn't have pediatric cancer activism. We wouldn't have patient-oriented research the way we have it now. It was like turning a battleship, but it was really the efforts of the uh, AIDS community that turned this battleship. So. Uh, I think when we look back in the annals of medical history 100 years from now, 
none of this will be forgotten. None of this was in vain. So I don't know if that's a comfort for those who experience great loss during this time, but uh, I just couldn't, uh, without this background, I just couldn't go forward to this to this presentation. Um, and I've probably said enough about that, but uh, <laughs> it's deeply impactful. And that's really, you know, my start into this patient-oriented research. That's why we're all together, you know, wearing our our our, our suits and ties, because <laughs> we knew the Baltimore Sun was showing up that day to take pictures. And that's when Sue Miller was uh, evening uh, Sun staff. Wow. Um, so we met, we've been at this for a long time, and we were looking at uh, T cell oriented, primary T cell oriented, and uh, vaccine oriented cures, which is really what this paper was about. Was about testing one of the early HIV vaccines in a trial that Bob was going to launch. Um, there wasn't much advance, as you know, especially in the vaccine world. Although we're starting to keep learning more and more information, and it's funding places like. Uh, at the NIH, we could do really long-term studies that we started to find broadly neutralizing antibodies and things like that, uh, that grew out of this um, completely new offices that were set up in the NIH and new centers that were set up. Um, and the big advance for me, because uh, I'm such a T-cell-centric person, came actually out of the uh, um, cancer research field, but the cancer research field wasn't first. It was actually the HIV research field first that started to engineer T cells to fight against this disease. So it's a little bit of a background, which is I just shared with you. We'll talk about some of the preclinical data about our duo CAR T cell trial and our successful manufacturing of those cells, and maybe a little bit on the clinical trial design. A little bit more background of uh, this is an HIV-1 virion a touching down onto a cell that it's about to infect, and it touches down it makes contact with two different proteins. And this you can imagine this as being a CD4 T cell. It's about to be infected with HIV. And here we zoom in a little bit more on this interaction. So here's the membrane of the virion uh, with the viral envelope like a protein, which touches CD4, the CD4 T cell. And that's the first contact that's made. And once this contact is made, there's a conformational change. You can see how these rotate and spin out a little bit. And a different epitope or region is exposed on this molecule that interacts with the second receptor, the CCR5 on the surface of that cell. Once these two receptors get engaged, we get more changes in this protein. It's a magnificent dance that then exposes another part that inserts into the membrane and causes membrane fusion. And once you get membrane fusion between the viral uh, envelope and the cell membrane, then the capsid enters in, reverse transcriptase go to work and makes a copy of that genome into the DNA that can be integrated into the host DNA. And that's where, for example, a reverse transcriptase inhibitor would work. Uh, but it's right here that these agents that are active here in this process are what we call fusion inhibitors. And uh, fusion can be blocked if we interfere in this process in the right way. So what about a little bit more background about how we've been driving a cell-based CAR T cell therapy cure for HIV. Well, in 2002, there's a pretty influential paper by uh, our colleague Steve Deeks and senior author uh, Kristen Hedge that um, uh, kind of set the stage here. And it was using uh, a retrovirus-based gene vector to engineer T cells to see if they could be resistant uh, to HIV and the CD4 with the zeta chain to maybe activate and expand some immunity there. Uh, in 2006, we moved on to the lentiviral system. So here's um, Carl June's paper with our co-founder for Caring Cross, Boro Dropulich, as uh, penultimate offer, along with Bruce Levine. And this is really the team from um, the University of Pennsylvania and the first company that Boro founded called Varexis. And uh, this was really the first time we ever put a lentivirus into uh, humans. Uh, with that product. And then now 2019, we've begun to develop another generation of what we're calling anti-HIV duo CAR T cells. And this is a paper from 2019 that we put out uh, with a lot of help from uh, Harris Goldstein uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of the specific way that I'm going to describe to you today, how we engineer T cells to be uh, resistant to and to mediate anti-HIV effects. So how do these work? Well, what we do, and the reason why we call them duo CAR T cells, we express two different glycoproteins on the surface of a cell. Once we've engineered that cell, inserted into its genome, the DNA encoding for those proteins, uh, the expression for these two molecules on the surface of that engineered T cell. Now, one of these chains, it has an, 
uh, terminus, we call it MD 1.22. And this is something that Dr. Demeter Dimitrov or MITCO designed. It's a minimized CD4 domain. That's why I kind of drew it like this long finger. It inserts right into GP120 as if it was interacting with CD4. So it really targets the GP120. And then when we get that conformational change that I just talked about, then there's a secondary um, uh, uh, interaction that happens. And that's exposure of the M36.4 epitope, which is really the epitope that interacts with um, the CCR5 binding site. Now, the advantage of that one is that it, this is actually also acts as a fusion inhibitor. So uh, we kind of have two hits on goal. We have two ways to stick to an HIV infected cell and we have the prevention of infection because we have this fusion inhibitory sequence expressed on its surface. Both of these are connected to intracellular activation domains that activate these T cells so that when they see a um, infect, HIV infected cell that expresses GP120 on its surface, it can kill those cells. So that's the basis, the biological basis of what we're doing and how we're engineering uh, these CAR T cells. And CAR means chimeric antigen receptor. I, I'm sure the, the, this group is aware of that, but this is not normally encoded by the genome. These are three different pieces of normal human proteins that we patch together, which is why it's called chimeric. So how do we demonstrate that these are indeed working and that um, it's uh, a viable approach. Well, the first thing we did is what we call an in vitro in the tissue culture study. And we used different um, HIV strains here listed one through 11 that also express a protein called luciferase that gives us a nice light signal uh, when we put in the uh, luciferin in the presence of ATB, it produces light. And we actually got that from fireflies. And so interestingly, this is our indicator of whether or not we're infecting cells in this tissue culture. So we can go from gold to gold. So we've turned these susceptible cells in the tissue culture dish. We've now infected them with HIV. Now, if we also had present in that dish, some of these modified human T cells that express that chimeric antigen receptor, we can see if their presence makes a difference in that infected culture. And when we look at day seven, if there was no inhibition, we'll get a lot of this signal or somewhat, if there's some inhibition, that signal will be lower. And if there's no signal whatsoever, we'll have a big complete inhibition of, of HIV replication. That shows the presence of that CAR T cell uh, prevented the infection expansion within that culture. And we tested three different um, uh, products here. Uh, one is a single chain alone. One is having both of those domains that I just described linked together on a single molecule, what we call a duocar expressed on two different molecules on the surface of the engineered T cell. And we're calling these each of these columns M1, M13, and D13, which is really our duocar. Uh, the clade representation is very broad from lots of different uh, geographic isolations. And what we see is that when we have this duocore format, we have much broader neutralization in this in vitro assay, over 99% for a variety of clades than over 98%. Um, so it's a much deeper and broader potent anti-HIV effect when we're in this duocore format. So uh, Dreamus, I saw that you also compared it to monoclonal antibody. Is that what that was, that the VCR01? Is that you were comparing it? The so, so the, that's a characterization of, of, okay. of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, like letting us know how well that worked compared to the duo CAR T cell. Am I reading nice, that correctly? Nice, Michael. Yes, I, I skipped over that column, but yes, <laughs> um, uh, that, that is characterization uh, of neutralization. Mm -hmm. and, and I think so, so for example, in this uh, clade C, we're getting really nice uh, yeah. HIV inhibition, right? Yeah, I see that. That's great. Thank you for that. Thank you. And um, I don't know, it, it, interrupt me at any time. Sure. Okay, so uh, the anti-HIV duocar eliminates cells with HIV now in what we would call a humanized mouse model. And the way this is done, we take uh, a mouse that's able to tolerate the presence of human cells, so it's immunosuppressed. It's the NSG mouse for those who follow these things. Uh, we can put in HIV infected cells within that mouse, and then we can also then treat 
what we would now call a humanized HIV infected mouse with uh, the anti HIV duo CAR T cells. And you'll see these three later letters all the time UTD control, that means untransduced for us. And that's the T cells that have been treated in the exact same way as these duo CAR T cells. They don't, don't express the duo CAR on their surface. So that's our control because highly activated T cells do have some antiviral effects on their own, even without the duo CAR on the surface. So we have to control for that. So we put in a low CAR T cell dose, so we wait seven days and let's see what happens. So just like in the tissue culture dish, we can measure HIV infection by how much light is being produced, the relative light units per million cells is how we're reading it out here on the Y axis. And on the X axis, um, of course, uninfected cells injected in the mouse clean don't create anything when we isolate those uh, splenocytes. Uh, the addition of the untransduced T cells does not prevent uh, infection. Uh, while the presence of uh, those single CAR expressors that I just described have some effect, but the duo CAR has a very, very strong effect. And when we look at uh, a PCR-based assay, where we're looking at actual uh, DNA copies um, per million cell, per million beta actin positive signals per million cells, you can see on this logarithmic scale that untransduced cells or the single CARs don't have much effect, but in all of the mice, except one, there's always that one mouse, and we can talk about later why that happened, um, we get complete uh, elimination. So the monocars by this assay failed to control HIV, but the duo cars did, showing that this is really a step forward in the ability to uh, control HIV infection in this model. And now we wanted to see like, okay, the other question you can ask, well, you put in these duo car T cells and uh, one of the reasons that Bob Silicano came to our lab many, many years ago from that picture I showed you is that we could actually test whether or not anti-HIV uh, CAR T cells can be super infected with HIV. And we showed that indeed they could be. And so here, you know, more than 30 years later, we're doing the same experiment inside of a humanized mouse, seeing if our engineered CAR T cells can be uh, infected during this process. And um, Sure enough, when we used this specific subtype infected PBMCs, the untransduced T cells themselves, when we gave it on the cars, do produce. And the um, duo car, at least the M1, is susceptible, a little more resistant with the one that has the fusion inhibitor present on its surface, and much more resistant when we have the duo car. So um, the one with just a CD4 binder. Um, not very, not very resistant. The, the fusion receptor a little bit uh, more and much more with the D13 or the Duo car. And you know, 30 days later, we can look at this as now a much longer term assay and using a different subtype. Um, what happens to the CD4 T cells that are present within the spleen of this humanized mouse model? Um, untreated mouse. This is the T cell frequency. We can see that untreated or or or, or the um, uh, presence of UTD control CAR T cells, uh, we lose the CD4 cells out of that spleen of that mouse, whereas the duo CARs, they're protected. So again, we're showing uh, two different things, that the spread of infection throughout those PBMCs and the uh, super infection of the CAR T cells are both uh, prevented when we have the duo CAR there. So we looked a little bit more at the phenotype of these cells, and this is a little bit more for the immunology and aficionados, but we know that if during the process of generating a CAR T cell, it begins to express cell surface markers such as CCR7, uh, CD95 for T stem cell memories, that they're able to persist longer once they're transferred into either animal model systems or actually into the clinic is the data that uh, we're chasing out now, especially in the oncology field. So. This is a characteristic, this is a product characteristic you wanna have. Uh, you wanna have T cells that have either SCM stem cell memory-like phenotypes or central memory-like phenotypes. And uh, whether we generated these uh, effector cells from HIV positive or negative, as we produce them, they're expressing this, uh, what we consider desired a product characteristics, they're gonna last longer in the cell. So we're not creating what, what, what we would call an exhausted cell phenotype. And now in this latest publication, uh, just came out in JCI Insight, and again, Kim Anthony Gond is the first author there just last month. Um, we wanted to you know, stress the system a little more and test a little bit more characteristics of our um, uh, in-mouse modeling. And so again, it's the same system as before. We had intrasplenic HIV infection, but now instead of co-injecting the CAR T cells into the spleen, 
we injected them into the tail vein to see if actually uh, they could circulate throughout the mouse and find uh, the infected cells within the spleen. And what we're able to show is that with these good phenotype characteristics, we could have a durable, longer lived response. And then we look at these uh, dual CAR T cells um, more than a few weeks later, 17 to 18 days later, um, untreated or untransduced cells still have a high level HIV infected in the spleen. Whereas even though it's a tail vein injection, uh, those CAR T cells can circulate, persist and find their targets and eliminate the HIV infected cells that we placed into the spleen. So just showing that it's uh, a robust system, at least as we do animal modelers, try uh, to demonstrate. Remus, may I ask a question about that? So you're putting mm -hmm. it into the, you're putting the CAR T cells in through the vein that's in the tail. Is that to show that you could inject it into a human and it would travel throughout the body? Is that what you're trying to imitate? That is exactly what we're trying to imitate because you know we, you could, wouldn't use these by you can't inject an HIV site you right. know w w within someone who's who's infected right it's it's disseminated so we want to show that these can track and find uh, what in this case the spleen would be the the site of infection so right um, that's exactly why you do that cool thanks mm -hmm. yeah and then. Um, this is showing that actually they, they, the, the duo CAR T cells go to a number of different places. Um, we can detect them in the peripheral blood um, long-term. Whereas interestingly enough, the untransduced, we, we, we couldn't actually detect them. So that either means that they were eliminated or that they just don't hang out very long. They're not getting the right kind of stimulation. Um, and if we look at all the different major organs here, liver, lung, and spleen, which is where we had that uh, those those infected cells, uh, we can detect the presence of the duo car. So there are indeed they're, they're doing their job. Um, they're going throughout um, the the NSG mouse, the immunosuppressed mouse, the humanized mouse, and finding HIV targets to take out. Um, so does this work? So all the work to this point has been with um, volunteer donors or purchased blood products from uh, HIV negative donors, what about people with HIV? Uh, can we generate uh, these duo cars uh, from blood that's been donated uh, someone who's living with HIV? And here's four different donors. And each one of them uh, essentially repeat the same experiment that we just presented to you that um, untransduced T cells from that donor, and this is you know, no treatment whatsoever in that same system are not able, but when we create duo cars from the T cells of these four different uh, donors, they can indeed control uh, HIV in that spleen of that animal mouse model. So it's a very uh, pleasing effect. So yes, it can happen. And then another question, and this was actually in response to a lot of reviewers we were getting and a lot of other comments when we would present this data, they were like, well, T cells aren't the only site of, 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 of infection. Uh, what about monocytes, an important HIV reservoir that is more difficult to kill uh, with an engineered T cell or, or a cytotoxic T lymphocyte? And so here, um, uh, HIV infected monocytes as well as HIV infected PBMCs were tested. And it's really panel A that's the, the relevant one here for this discussion is that Again, using that same indicator system that gives us a signal when HIV infection happens, um, here's the level that we see from a one, two, three, four, five, six different uh, monocyte donors. When we uh, co-incubate that infection assay in vitro infection assay with untransduced T cells, they still are uh, infected just fine. And we get a massive reduction when the duo CAR T cells present, of course, is statistically significant. There is a, a blush of signal there. It's not as low as uninfected, but it does show an important ability to recognize and reduce uh, uh, infections in monocytic cell types, as well as in um, infected PBMCs in this assay. So all of this preclinical data, and, and crucially the data from uh, some some uh, volunteers living with HIV led to our ability to uh, submit a, an IND uh, application. And the PI is, of course, Dr. Stephen Deeks from University of California, San Francisco. We would test these, what we're calling LVGP120 duo CAR T cells um, in a clinical trial. And so 
uh, the clinical trial is open and ongoing and accruing. So the nuts and bolts are that there's a lymphophoresis, which is a leukophoresis, which is uh, removing a, a large dose of um, a white blood cells from the HIV positive uh, participant in this trial, and then enriching those for CD4 and CD8 T cells with immunomagnetic beads, activating those T cells with an activation reagent, and then um, transducing them with our lentiviral gene vector. And then once that lentiviral gene vector uh, delivers the DNA encoding the, the two duo cars into that uh, T cell product, we can then now detect it on their surface. These expand over the period of uh, eight or more days, and then they can be formulated and then reintroduced back into the participant. Now, the platform that we're using is shown in the middle. This is a single device called the Prodigy by Multeni Biotech. And it's the device that we're using in this um, project, but we're not by any means married to it. If you know some of our past lives, both Boro and I had previous association with um, Milteni, and we stood up their CAR T-cell pipeline for them before the, uh, we left for the formation of Caring Cross. And one of the main motivations for forming Caring Cross was to be able to, to focus uh, using this nonprofit uh, on HIV uh, cure therapies based in CAR T-cells. And so we're really happy that we were able to launch Caring Cross and be able to in, uh, really get this clinical trial launch with our partners like Steve. Uh, um, Remus, there's a question mm -hmm. in the chat that someone had uh, about the participants in the trial. Are they stopping ART before the leukophoresis? Yes, that's been the controversial question behind this trial. And I think the field is divided. If I go um, to the next slide, I'll skip sure. over one, but I'll go back to it. This is really the, the clinical trial design schema that we show. And this trial is funded by the California um, uh, Stem Cell Agency, CIRM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And Steve Deeks is at UCSF and Dr. Meredith Abedi at UC Davis is the PI at the Davis site. And our first two enrollees are actually at UC Davis. And the study design is this, this is exactly your question is, that we do an analytical treatment interruption um, as we begin this trial. It's interesting with the long acting like Cabanuva, um, can a person on that agent actually participate in this trial? Well, we mm -hmm. think it would confound the results so much that uh, we're asking participants to come off of that, go back on a more standard therapy or a, a slightly older, less long acting therapy and uh, let that wash out before they enroll. But there is indeed a uh, treatment interruption because that allows us to see if the CAR T cell uh, will be able to control uh, uh, reactivation and expansion uh, of the latency reservoir into an active reservoir. Uh, so the first cohort of three patients, um, there'll be no lymphodepletion. Now I haven't talked about lymphodepletion whatsoever, but CAR T cells in the field of oncology, especially for hematologic malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma, are always, the, 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 the patient is always pre-treated with uh, cyclophosphamide and fludarabine. And these are two agents. They're not given at the same level as you would give for chemotherapy for a malignancy. But what they do is they um, lymphodeplete, which is take out a large number of the peripheral blood T cells. Now, what lymphodepletion does fully is really an, uh, an area of active study, but there is a homeostasis that occurs in the body that sets the level of T cells that are present in the periphery. And part of that is the presence of cytokines or growth factors in the blood. And when you take out a lot of the normal T cells that are present, those cytokines and growth factors are available for the CAR T cells when we infuse them. And they help to expand them so that you see a better therapeutic effect. So that's been shown for sure in hematologic malignancies. We have no idea if that is the case uh, in these HIV trials. And it's something where we're, we desperately want to find out. So the next step in this trial, the next cohort does have lymphodepletion. It's the same, what we would call a very low dose of CAR T cells, three times 10 to the fifth per uh, kilogram. That's far below the doses that are used for any oncology trial. 
And then the final cohort includes both lymphodepletion and uh, a, a dose range that's a little more in keeping of what we're seeing within the uh, leukemia and lymphoma space for CAR T-cell therapy. So through these uh, three steps, uh, with lots of time in between, uh, we hope to see uh, progressively improved responsiveness. But most important, this is a phase one, two-way study. We want to see safety and safety signals. Mm -hmm. So that's the primary objective. If we see efficacy on this, on this setup, that's great. It's, a, it's in some way, uh, the secondary objective is to measure the persistence and impact on the HIV uh, reservoir. Um, Remus, we have a question that came up, um, so I'm going to read it exactly as it was written. I think we all want to know this. It's been three months since the first patient's infusion and one month since the second patient's infusion. Are their viral loads still undetectable or not? <laughs> and I don't know if you can answer these, um, but that was the question that was asked. Yes, so that is a fantastic question. Um, so I have a PhD degree, <laughs> and I'm scientific director of a nonprofit organization uh, that has manufactured and oversees the creation of these CAR T cells. Uh, Dr. Steve Deeks and Murdad and Betty are the clinical PIs, and it's going to be up to them to re read out the patient results. Um, and so I don't want to share any of them whatsoever. What I will share is that, uh, that the infusions have been safe, right? Mm -hmm. Very early days, three months and one month is very short if we're expecting this to be kind of a durable, impactful therapy. You know, no one's ever seen a CAR T-cell therapy work without lymphodepletion in the leukemia and lymphoma world. So mm -hmm. we don't know if this is going to work at all uh, within what you would call the infectious disease or HIV space. But no, I'm, I'm not going to give you uh, clinical readouts. <laughs> You'll have to invite Steve or, or Meredad to, to give that talk. Um, I, part of the reason why I've survived so long is I know how not to get my knuckles uh, <laughs> slapped for doing that kind of thing. So, <laughs> um, also, so uh, Remus, it might be a good time to ask you about the uh, or that make people aware of, um, you know, this in cancer patients has caused some neurologic issues while we're talking about safety, and we haven't really we've we've been made by the FDA to to you know to look out for that signal, but we really haven't experienced it so far, and. And I think that's a really good thing from a safety aspect. Yeah. So, so what Linda's, uh, what you're referring to is some is uh, there's two things that are going on. Uh, one is more broadly seen in the leukemia and lymphoma world called cytokine release syndrome, which is where the there's so much disease around in these leukemia and lymphoma patients, and actually so many normal B cells that are also identified by the CD19 CAR T cells that you get a massive degranulation effect. You might even get something called tumor lysis syndrome because so many cells are being killed at the same time. I think the pathophysiology or the biology what's happening in, in HIV is going to be very different because we have far less antigen. We have far less targets that are going to activate those T cells. So I think scientifically, we can expect those um, side effects to be much lower although as you have to do the trial, right? That's why we do trials. Um, that's generalized cytokine release syndrome, which is not rare in, in uh, oncology and leukemia and lymphoma space, is quite manageable at the centers who do a lot of CAR T cell therapies. Uh, the patients can receive anti-IL-6 receptor antibody. Uh, they can receive other agents like anakinra that blocks IL-1 signaling and, uh, the clinicians know to act much earlier, as soon as there's a slight rise in fever or other things. Some of the centers are giving um, anti-cytokine release syndrome agents preemptively, just as part of the protocol, because it does not impact um, outcome on disease. So uh, there's lots of research on how to engineer that that, that happens less, but I think the, the, the most common cytokine release syndrome, A, is not to be as expected to be as severe, if at all present, and anti-HAV duocar therapy because there's just not as much antigen around. And um, uh, B, if it does happen, I think we can handle it. Now there's a much more rare uh, side effect. Uh, some call that ICANS, which is uh, a severe uh, central nervous system reactivity or toxicity that's been seen in um, some of the uh, leukemia trials. Uh, it's relatively rare. Um, we don't know if it's 
one in 500 or one in a thousand or one in a hundred. Um, but it's probably in that range. And we don't fully understand why. So that's actually something that everyone needs to uh, keep their eyes and ears open for. It could be that there's so many activated T cells that something happens to the vasculature in the central nervous system that we get kind of an inexorable um, kind of edema there. Uh, it could be that there's cross reactivity with some of the antigens like CD19 that's present on certain cells within the CNS. That's also a possibility. So it's another area of active uh, research, but it's something that we certainly have to keep our, our eyes and ears open for. Um, so thank you for, for highlighting that. And that's why this is a very slow escalation study to make sure, uh, at least in these original first nine patients, we don't see this. And of course, we'll have to do expansion cohorts to see if it happens at all. Right. Remus, there's uh, a question about how long are the volunteers kept in the clinic for observation? I don't know if you could talk to that, since that's sort of related to the safety issues that we've been discussing. Yes. So we're not quite at the outpatient setting, but they're not kept very long. Um, uh, just a few days to look at them. Um, the way this trial was written, it was very heavily weighted towards safety. In order to enroll in this trial, you had to have, uh, let's say, a, a safety net of someone who's willing to essentially be with you 24-7. Um, uh, you're not allowed to drive a car for 30 days. And uh, someone has to be there to be able to report out if you're starting to feel any side effects or any symptoms. Um, and that's been restrictive, right? Because let's say if you live on your own or let's say you have a job that requires you to drive, mm -hmm. that kind of takes you out of this. But this trial, because it was first in human with this product, was, was written very conservatively such that uh, we mentioned the side effects, a potential side effect, again, we haven't seen it, we don't know, um, is a, a type of mental confusion that happens during cytokine release syndrome. So the thought was like, well, if someone is starting to have a fever, um, they may not be able to like report in that they're having a fever <laughs> or, or contact their provider to come in. So uh, the, the safety margin here is really uh, making sure that the participant is in with a network of, 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 of people who can take care of them, observe them and, and back them up should any of these things happen. We'll have a better idea of how this happens, but uh, CAR-T CAR cell therapy is moving very, very rapidly. There's lots of proposals to make it a, an outpatient process because we're, we're able to handle these side effects so much better. And at least in the, in the oncology space, um, that, that fever, the slight rise in temperature happens uh, well before any of the other more severe symptoms. Uh, so uh, just showing up the moment that happens. Uh, so taking your temperature a few times throughout the day is sufficient. And we can look towards the future if you have a wearable medical device or something like that that, meet, that reports out your temperature in real time. Um, but you know th that is not an approved device and uh, we don't want to complicate this trial even further by also testing a non-approved wearable device to report out your temperature. But I think as we start having um, uh, devices like that approved and associated with these types of trials, it'll be even higher margin of safety. Um, I hope that answers that question. Yes. Okay. Um, and just to point um, out to everyone, I put the listing on clinicaltrials.gov for the study that Remus is referring to. If you have any questions, you can look at that as well. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is just um, the things that we do, especially from our end, to make sure that the manufacturing of these cells passes all the safety and stringency markers that are required um, by the FDA. Interestingly, we, we manufacture these cells. That is, we, we take them out of the body, give them the vector, expand them in the absence of antiretroviral drugs. And this kind of gives us an added signal of whether or not as that a duo car is expressed on the T cell if, if indeed it's uh, active. If you see a, a rampant expansion of, of HIV within that product that's being produced, then 
kind of a signal it's not working and that product should not be administered. So we make sure that there's no uh, replication competent lentivirus. This is one of the risks. It's never been seen, but it's possible because we're using a gene vector that has some components derived from lentiviruses that they could recombine and make another virus. Chances are very low, but it's something that we have to test for. We have to make sure that um, part of the envelope protein that's used in the vector is not expanding, that uh, P24 is, you know, as a, as a test for the presence of HIV is negative, as well as the reverse transcriptase test is negative. Um, we have to have no evidence of, of HIV being reactivated and no evidence that the transgene within uh, the, the transduced cell is not being mobilized, is not detected uh, in the duo CAR T product. So that's a PCR test as well. So there's lots of tests that we do to make sure that there's no molecular reactivation of, um, of, of the vector itself and that the HIV that is present within this uh, patient's blood product that is now off of antiretroviral so that it's not expanding within that culture. Um, uh, we've already spent some time on this slide and talked about the primary and secondary objectives. And really this is uh, where we're at today. What is the future direction? How are we gonna ensure not just that we can do this technologically intensive intervention, but how can we make sure that it has low cost and it's equitably applied uh, towards an HIV cure. So an organization that I'm sure you've heard about is a global gene therapy initiative, the GGTI. It's a weekly call that many of us on this call are on and where we talk about these, these very points of how we can ensure low cost and equitable access to cell and gene therapies for an HIV cure. And also our sickle cell colleagues uh, uh, are faced with the same question. As you know, a, a product that could be used for sickle cell disease was just approved for beta thalassemia or um, transfusion dependent thalassemia known as Cooley's anemia. And that Bluebird product costs $2 million. So uh, if we invent cures that cost $2 million, uh, they're not at all applicable for the rest of the world. And when we talk to our colleagues around the world, uh, they don't want to sit on the sidelines. They want to participate in HIV cure research as well as uh, sickle cell cure research. So um, we have to find ways around this uh, because these centers want to develop the research and clinical infrastructure to bring the cures to where um, they're needed most. So we're working to shorten this process, um, to try alternative devices and, and do something that's maybe on the order of three days instead of eight to 12. And if you want to look at this field more broadly, uh, uh, Dr. Steve Deeks and Sharon Lewin and, and a cast of superstars put together this uh, article that was published in 2021, talking about the research priorities for an HIV cure uh, from the uh, IAS Global Scientific Strategy Working Group. And it talks about not just CAR T cell cure, but maybe the next generation of cures where we don't have to go through all this whole, what we call an ex vivo or outside the body manufacturing process, or perhaps if we find the right type of particle, whether it's a, a lentiviral particle, or maybe it's a particle like the coronavirus vaccine, that's a, a formulated particle of, of a lipoprotein complexes that can somehow deliver the right type of um, gene sequences, and that the CAR T cells could be generated within the body through an injection. That would really uh, bring down the cost of what we're proposing to do. So whether viral-based or uh, kind of a physico-chemical based particle, being able to create engineered T cells within the body and having them expand within the body um, is, a, is a very large, uh, uh, not just hope, uh, lots of activity going on right now within that field. So this anti-HIV dual CAR T cell therapy, it's a new type of adoptive immunotherapy where two CARs are used to engineer T cells to treat HIV infection. And they each uh, contribute different characteristics that we talked about. The preclinical data demonstrated that they reduce HIV viral load by eliminating cells with HIV in our humanized mouse model, uh, cells that are actively producing HIV, and they protect, protect the CD4 T cells from HIV infection. So we're not introducing more cells to be infected by introducing duo CAR T cells. Some of the of, of, of us who have been in this field for a long time remember, oh, we could grow a bunch of HIV specific T cells outside the body and then reinfuse them. Well, they were all immediately reinfected upon reinfusion. So having that fusion inhibitor aspect of this is really important. Mm -hmm. um, we've demonstrated our ability to manufacture these high quality duo CAR T cells at clinical scale uh, with T cells from people with HIV. And that led us to the ability to open up this trial 
And there's that clinical trial number that Michael uh, posted in the chat. Mm -hmm. So we have to acknowledge a, a cast of characters. Uh, you know, by no means this is a single effort. The animal modeling by uh, Dr. Harris Goldstein's lab at Albert Einstein was essential. The original binders, the MD 1.22 and M36.4, were generated by Mitko, uh, Dr. Demeter Dimitrov, who's at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, clinical leadership by Steve and and Meredad. We couldn't do anything without that. They're, they're the ones who spearheaded the CIRM application as well as the IND applications. Um, University Hospitals, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. Um, this is where we had a long-term collaboration. And this is actually where for this trial, the CAR T cells are being manufactured. We hope in the next trials will be manufactured at the point of care at Davis, at uh, UCSF or other perhaps alpha clinics uh, throughout California. And we're really grateful to CIRM for support uh, some support has come from Bill Melinda Gates for training and implementation. And um, thanks to our colleagues, the Global Gene Therapy Initiative, who cheer, we all cheer one another on and, and the different things we're trying. And the original uh, vector, the vector that we're using was manufactured by uh, Lentigen. And as part of um, the creation of Caring Cross, we were allowed to pull out the IP and the vectors uh, to create these trials. So we're grateful to those manufacturers uh, at Lentigen who made the vector that we're using in these trials. And so, of course, uh, thanks uh, to, to not just DARE, but the other Delaney collaboratories uh, throughout the country that are working for this, and um, as well as for our support and our funders. And want more information, you can visit us. You can visit us at our Caring Cross website. You can follow us on Twitter. I've tried to get onto Mastodon and it's been very confusing. If someone can explain to me how to do that, I'll try that. Um, we have a special sub part of our webpage on the HIV Cure Project. And at Caring Cross, we do research. We have research labs. Uh, we have spun out a company, a, a B Corporation for the production of, of viral vectors that is gonna very soon uh, create vector to support these projects. And uh, we hold talks throughout the, throughout the year uh, once a month, we have an educational talk, and once a month, we have an edu uh, a technology talk. Our next talk is coming Friday is by some of you may know uh, Dom Kemp's, who's executive director at Summertel as part of H3 Africa, and he's going to be talking about accelerating progress towards an HIV cure for Africa. So if you go on our website, you can get the details of how to listen to that talk as well. Uh, so thanks. That's the, that's the summary questions that Michael sent me. So um, <laughs> maybe I'll leave it there and, and take any questions that might come across the board here. Sure. We've had a few questions pop up in the chat, and I'm going to go backwards through them. So the latest one was, are all the cohorts of that trial um, fully enrolled? If not, um, how can we help get those enrolled? I think... I think this this uh, for, uh, format is actually one way you can do. If you know someone uh, who who might be eligible, we would love for them to be enrolled. Um, uh, finding candidates who can be enrolled, uh, who are willing to be enrolled, and who have that um, support network that's part of the consenting process right. um, takes a little effort. So. Uh, if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov site, you'll have the numbers to to call in and and see if indeed uh, you'd be willing to participate. We do have we've had a number of people inquire and then realize, okay, I can't drive for a number of days. I need someone someone who can report in on me and my 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 condition. Um, it's been a challenge, and so. Uh, if this talk serves any purpose, if it can support people who want to uh, participate, especially in the you know UC Davis or UCSF areas, that'd be really, really uh, exciting for us. Mm. Um, and we have a question here from James. Uh, does the duo CAR T cells, which will be tested in Uganda, have the same construction as the duo CAR T cells in the US? <laughs> well, we don't have a <laughs> approved trial in Uganda. That is a goal. Um, we're trying to lay the ground for it. It would be the exact same one, yes. Okay, cool. Um, is continued antigen expression required for long-term persistence of the duo cars? I'm thinking in terms of resistance to new infections. <laughs> that is that is an excellent question. So th the reason why I kind of, I didn't show all the details, we have lots of flow cytometry and cytop data showing the, the, the phenotype, the, the flavor of those T cells, that they are long-lived T cells. Um, 
for T cells to persist long term, at least CAR T cells, it seems like they need they'll probably need some GP120 to be around. So if they're completely effective and wipe out all the viral reservoirs, then we don't have a, a question. Um, now, would they be present for reinfection? That's a good question. Uh, for our cells, we're wondering um, if they'll be long lived on their own or if they'll need a boost, um, such as introducing GP120, kind of like you introduce a corona vaccine. So maybe you'd show up once a year and get a little uh, expression of GP120 into the system to keep the CAR T cells going. So there, there's either keep persisting by, by adding some antigen now and then. Um, if we had really smart CAR T cell antigen, they could do that on their own. You could have other quote signals to drive them. Um, uh, I love the optimism of that question that there would be so little uh, 120. The, the question would be, are, are those T cells still around and to prevent reinfection? But that certainly would be the goal. Mm. Um, like the goal of any vaccine would be to, to, to generate a long lived T cell response. Mm -hmm. Um, another question is, is there any information that can be disclosed regarding the CAR T cells persistence in the first patient? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was an easy one to answer. Um, okay. And there's another question here. This one's a little specific. James was asking this. Um, if there's an HIV strain that can resist M36.6, can that HIV strain escape from the duo CAR T cells? Is that possible? Of course, yeah. I mean, we are. If 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 there is a strain that isn't impacted by the presence of MD one point two two, that minimize CD four domain or the M thirty six point four, then yes, that's entirely possible. Um, that is, um, I think, a limitation in the leukemia lymphoma trials. I think when patients relapse, their disease has mutated such that they no longer express what the car is specific for. So yeah, the car can only see what it can see mm. and its eyes and ears into the body are those two specific binders. So um, we like these binders because the first one is actually, it, it inserts into a super conserved cleft in GP120. And we think if that's mutated, then the, the virus will not be able to interact with CD4 at all. It will have mutated basically away from its the biology that it needs to, to super infect. Um, that question, of if we if we get around the fusion and inhibition of M36, then yeah, I think that's, then those cells might become susceptible to super infection as we saw uh, from the primary data. That's a great observation and a great question. Great. Um, and Karina- How long asking, will it take you, to, Remus, to figure that out, that aspect of it? How long, how much more, uh, how many more patients or what, when will you be comfortable in ascertaining whether you're gonna have to do this every year, you know, some sort of GP120 infusion or something else. Well, that, um, I am not comfortable till it gets a full cure, right? So I'm not gonna be comfortable. Um, right. In other words, uh, yeah, we don't I, know I, yet. Yeah. No, okay. I mean, we're really in the safety. I mean, we still haven't even, yeah. we haven't done lymphodepleted patient yet, so. Yeah. Um, uh, as these safety signals come in, we'll be right. able to look at those longer term impacts. But, you know, as we're learning uh, from the leukemia and lymphoma side of CAR T cell therapy, um, if we see a signal, a signal that sticks, you know, in a significant percentage of participants, uh, then we really have firm, firm founding to keep, you know, keep iterating and keep yeah. getting better. I mean, that's really what I meant if we could get to enough patients for phase a phase three of this we might be able to we might be able to tell sooner rather than later huh absolutely um yeah. we're completely open to actually other uh investigator initiated trials we could use the same car t cell product i mean i'm actually I'm in active discussion i just came from back from the sitc meeting um of other groups who are actually interested in using this perhaps in the context of treatment for leukemia and lymphoma so perhaps in the set, sets of patients who have leukemia and lymphoma, we could create what happened with, with our dear friend Adam uh, or, or, or Timothy, you know, the London Berlin patients, right? So let's, that might be another angle into it through, through the oncology side without mm -hmm. requiring a full uh, bone marrow transplant. Let's see if we can actually add CAR T cells to their therapy. Um, and 
uh, I think there's going to be lots of creative ways. So if, if you're an investigator and you have a creative way that you want to try this, we're, we're, all, we're all ears. Mm -hmm. um, at our current funding levels, these are investigator initiated trials. You know, Caring Cross is a nonprofit. We are not like a pharma that can come in and, and put $50,000 down per patient kind of thing uh, because we're not driving towards the product. We're, we're trying to, driving towards a, a cure that can be broadly shared. Right. Um, there's one last question I wanted to bring up. Um, Kareen was asking, what is the plan to help ensure participant readiness and resilience for these types of trials? Can you speak to that at all? Well, I love that question. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and I think Kareen probably knows better than I do. Um, part of the uh, patient navigation and care team at each clinical center is going to be essential of keeping uh, engaged and um, really speaking with and counseling participants. Uh, I think a participant who's taken the risk to participate in this trial, and there is some risk, the main risk I would think as we talk about if a patient's undergoing analytical treatment interruption is transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, so there has to be lots of counseling with the, with the participant and their partner. Um, and and uh, we have to look at the larger uh, uh, um, feelings or the implications like, oh, my, my genome was altered because I have a CAR T cell and now I'm gonna be carrying the signal with me. What does that mean? I think some people think it's really cool and they're engaged, but I think there's all, you know, whenever we undergo a medical procedure, there's lots of thoughts we have. <laughs> and so I, I uh, strong, uh, strong psychosocial support, if you just want to put a, a word on it, is super, super important. Um, I'm in the Department of Pediatrics. We have a long history of psychosocial support because we have a lot of uh, patients that come in with brain cancer and, and their, their therapies uh, throw them for a loop impact their development and their growth. So there's been a, a consistent history of that in pediatrics. In adult oncology, not so much because the patient press is, is so large and you know, trying to get mental health services in the US is always a challenge in and of itself. So yes, I pray that uh, this type of trial is accompanied with those type of interventions that uh, we can form a real patient community. And um, I think that's kind of where I started this talk is with the slide of, of community. So moving right. beyond, a, 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 and I think, and I just, I just went through Christensen's book about um, healthcare reform, and it's really going to be patient groups that know how to pressure insurance companies and providers to provide the care that they need that's going to change healthcare because it's not going to be done for us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it, I think it's not should be asked for, it should be demanded. You know, that's really the hardest thing because, I mean, a lot of the things that we were able to accomplish in, uh, in our history of activism was um, working with industry to get them to change their entire way of doing things, you know, which was a really big, really big deal because millions and billions of dollars were involved in the way they did it before and tried and true. And they were like old bankers, you know, but yeah. the insurance companies. The insurance companies are different. You know, we had leverage over the over the, the over pharma because of the FDA, and the FDA listened to us, and we were on those approval committees and all of that stuff. But the you know the insurance companies are onto themselves, and with ACA, they really are in the driver's seat. So unless you sue them for some sort of a discrimination thing, you really it's pretty hard to um, to move that mountain. I'm not saying that we shouldn't keep trying or whatever, but it's just a different animal than we've, we've, uh, we've worked with before and been successful with before. Mm -hmm. Well, so, thank you so much for this talk today. It's been great. Out that we're a little bit over time now, so we should be uh, wrapping up, but Remus, wonderful job. Thank you so much yeah. for giving us the answers that we were craving. Um, good to see you again and have you fill in for us at the last minute like this. I think it's wonderful. Um, right. Thank you, Michael, for being out today. I really appreciate it. Yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> right. so I want to thank everyone for participating and joining us here. Uh, do pay attention to your email. Once I get these videos uh, recorded and posted, um, I will send out the links. So for those of you who missed part of it or want to share it with someone, you can do so. Um, so that'll be coming out hopefully later this afternoon or if not tomorrow. Okay, so be look out for that. Um, and you can see Remus in the conversation there in the chat. We have a lot of people thanking you. Um, so thank you once again for your uh, excellent presentation.
Remember, right. everybody, too, we have off next month. There's going to be no call mm -hmm. next month, and we will reconvene on January the 17th with Paula Cannon, and the name of her talk is Engineering B-Cells. So you have a month off for right. um, holidays. Yes. Okay. Thanks again, Reems. This was wonderful. Right. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks. Okay. Be well. Thank you.